What's going on, everybody? I am the Bad Duck, and you are the internet. Welcome back to another video. The Scream series is one of the most important to me. It's the home of my favorite movie of all time, and brewed my love for the horror genre. At the forefront of the franchise is Sydney Prescott, and of course, opposite of her is Ghostface, that both have had a recurring battle of both wits and brawn for over 25 years. Unlike the other big hitters in horror, Ghostface is never the same character dying the mask. Today, we're going to rank those faces behind the mask. Obviously, spoilers if you haven't watched some of the movies, and we aren't doing the show since it's not really Ghostface, technically like with Slasher, and Season 3 is weird to say the least. Let's get into it. Number 9, Charlie. The character of Charlie is weak from the beginning. To me, the character was playing second fiddle to his psychic Robbie, which I, I had to Google both their names just to remember them. While Charlie's role as kind of a second fiddle could help his character, it doesn't in any way. Honestly, if they retooled the script a little bit, Jill being the only killer would have been good, but they had some plot holes that if that would to occur. So we got a weak and often forgotten Charlie. There's theories and evidence that proves that he might have killed most people throughout the film, but here that really doesn't give him a boost. Another issue with the character is that when he's revealed as one of the killers, it feels more like an... Okay, and now you're dead. In the end, he's a body for Jill, and it was a plaything for her the whole entire time. And that is, in fact, a bad ghost face. Number 8, Roman. Roman isn't a bad ghost face because of him. Rather, the writing failed this character, and ended him dwelling in the dungeon of this list. His kills are too complicated and unrealistic, which would be fine for maybe Jason or Freddy, who are known to play with their food more or less, but you can't tell me the house explosion is realistic in any way for what is mostly a realistic franchise. Rome was supposed to be accompanied by a second ghost face, but script rewrites after Columbine threw most of the good ideas of this movie and threw it right out the window. Rather than making Roman loosely related to Sydney and more like a stalkerish fanboy, they opted for more of the half-brother route which really hurts the film and hurts his character. Not to mention that before the reveal, the audience thought he was dead in that coffin thing. The magic voice changer makes it seem like he's stupid than the other ghost face and undercuts everything he, he does in the film. He's a victim of a lot of rewrites and retcons that, again, hurt the film because they go and try to retcon the first film and no one touches the first film here. He's a victim of, the, of a lot of rewrites and rare cuts, and overall just the weakest movie of the franchise, making him one of the weaker ghost spaces. Number 7. Mrs. Loomis. Mrs. Loomis felt odd, to say the least. Again, the script went under heavy rewrites due to a Lee script, and in all made for an odd movie, to say the least. Scream 2 is good, don't get me wrong, just odd. I've never felt this way. <laughs> Need I say more? She kind of pops out of nowhere. Not the character, but the relation to Sydney and everything. At least Roman's case, we got hints and evidence that this ghost face was connected to Maureen. Pops up and Sin immediately recognizes her. At whatever, I guess, this campus is just that massive that Sin never bumped into her. Her goal of revenge is a boring motivator. Revenge is better than Roman's because at least it doesn't recon a masterpiece of the first film, but it also just feels lazy to say the least because they didn't have anything better to do. Again, I think the first part, the first script of Scream 2 with the killers being uh, Timmy Fallon's character in The Roommate, which I can't remember her name right now, um, would have been perfect, but they had to just throw Mrs. Loomis in there. It was really weird. That's why she ends up at the bottom of this list. Number six, Richie. Richie is a tricky one for me. I love his character, and Jack Quaid does an amazing job as the character. To me, Richie isn't scary. His reveal was almost too obvious, and he seemed to be just the planner. I don't think 
many of those kills where Rooch is doing it, and doing that knocks him down a peg. I do think he's a lot better than Mrs. Loomis and everyone else below him in this list, but I can't make a decent argument for why he should be above any of the other ones coming up. He's a copycat of Billy down to the blue plaid shirt and dating the final girl. At least Billy got his hands dirty, and worst of all, he's an MCU fanboy, basically. I bet he still cuts things mid when they're decent and fun. Number 5. Mickey. Mickey is the opposite of Richie's issue. He's not in most of the film leading up to his reveal, and that hurts his case a lot. But I think what I like most about Mickey is while he isn't in it for much, he's malicious and straight up psychopathic. He doesn't really care for himself or what he's done, he's just there for the murder and to get famous off the trial. As we've seen for some reason, that works with serial killers in the past and somehow with killers of the past now? I think having a killer just be there for fun is the best possible motive for a character of this caliber. It's what boggles my mind about people with Michael Myers. He just wants to kill. That's all he wants. Lori in Halloween is just completion anxiety. It's called completion anxiety. It's very common in males. But like I said, he's just gone for a majority of the film and has huge points for him. For him here where he could have easily been top three if he had you know been in the movie for the last 45 minutes before it's reveal number four amber amber is one of the more fun antagonists and like mickey is straight up psycho she's balls to the wall an absolute mad woman her kills are also some of the best and borderline beautiful in a sense i am upset they didn't go with the initial route with her dating tara but i guess i'll live with that not being a thing. Honestly, it's not even the major things, but it's the little things. Here, just Amber being fucking iconic and better than she should have been ever. What the fuck? Girlfriend or palette? <laughs> Hi. Hi. And where were you? Netflix. Ooh, yeah. Super solid alibi, bro. So where were you? I was questioning Amber and her friends at the sheriff station. Yeah, I came as soon as I heard. But you know, the Netflix alibi is good too. <laughs> What the fuck, Mindy? What do you think? Trap. Fuck it. Not really. Hey, baby. You did all Can't have a bona fide Halloween without Jamie Lee. Nope. <laughs> Yeah, and he died like a pussy. Number three, Jill. Jill, off the ending of Scream 3, continues the trend of the press guns just being fucking loony. She really makes this movie. I love this movie and its ending wouldn't go over smoothly without Emma Roberts' performance here and the writing. Her motive is so much better than the others. Her cousin is famous for all the wrong reasons, and while she doesn't get that through her head, she decides, fuck it, I'm gonna do it myself. I'm gonna be doing the murder and be the victim. Honestly, that's what's so great about her. Not to mention, to make this all go off without an issue, performs the most batshit performance to cover all the acts of murder up. And like Amber, it's a lot of fun to watch. While she doesn't do a lot of killing, I think she's intelligent enough to be placed in the spot. And well, I mean, she gets away with it. It isn't for long, but she still gets away with it initially. And I think that's what's most fun about Jill's character. Number two, Stu. I don't know if you're expecting anything else from me or really anyone else. Stu takes this spot for actually giving a lot of evidence who he is throughout the movie. Whether it was Lillard or Craven's choice, I don't know, but a lot of care was put into it. And what I mean by this is that um, Stu's a lefty rather than the normal righty, and he uses two hands to plunge the, the knife in. He also cleans the dagger quite often uh, to nod to Stu. And, Bill, Billy does just straight up more right handed stuff and just kind of gets straight to the murder. <laughs> On top of that, he's quite funny. While most of the final act is very serious and most would play it straight, you get a few chuckles throughout the final act due to Stu's character and Lillard's great performance. Even before his reveal, he is one of the most best characters throughout the film. There's a reason why a lot of fans want him back, for whatever reason, outside of the Scream 3 outline, of course. It's quite hard to balance the seriousness of playing a serial killer, and I have enough talent to also make those same people watching you commit murder laugh at all the things you're doing. Number 1. Billy. 
Billy is the mastermind of the first film, and outside of Jill, is the most successful at getting away with it. But also fucks up Sid more than anyone else in this franchise. He gets caught and released, basically clearing himself in everyone's eyes, including Sid's, orchestrating a whodunit and acting as a red herring and the killer at the same time, not to mention he turns to the second one, and it's all downhill for the rest of the cast. We all go a little mad sometimes. Anthony Perkins, psycho. While students cracking jokes in the kitchen, Billy is straight up terrifying while he's coming through the house, and there's not many of these killers that actually scare me as much as he would. Unlike Stu, he actually does come back and even gives one of the best side characters of the movie, even if the timeline doesn't match up very well. But that's all for me today. Let me know your list down below. Don't forget to leave a like, hit subscribe, it's always free. And as always, have a good night.